Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, Rodas Newsmaker uh, with uh, John Connaughton, um, co-managing partner of uh, Bain Capital. Um, I'm uh, Greg Rumeliotis, uh, corporate finance and EST editor for uh, Reuters, and I'm pleased to welcome uh, John uh, with us. Um, uh, as many of you know, Bain is one of the world's um, biggest uh, private equity firms with about 160 billion in assets at an asset man under uh, with assets under man assets under management and Bain uh, invests across private equity real estate venture capital uh corporate credit um insurance um and even crypto and blockchain startups so um thank you again so much John John for joining us in this um very uh, momentous time for um, markets and investors. Um, maybe we can start by discussing risk and return. Everybody at the moment is trying to find their way in this new world of high interest rates and extreme volatility. Um, how do you approach it? Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. And uh, it is a world of volatility out there. And uh, it's it's a terrific question. Um, and, and certainly you who cover the markets uh, on a daily basis uh, and even even more more frequently for, for many of you. I you know, I do think this volatility presents something that we've all seen before uh, in some ways. I think, you know, when I started out back in, in 1987, uh, you know, we had the we had the savings and loan crisis that followed. We had a recession. You know, we had higher rates. Uh, you know, and and so the idea of volatility during a short period of time, you know, is certainly something our industry has seen before. We've seen it obviously in in the dot com bubble. We saw it uh, in the GFC. We saw it during COVID in a weird, weird, very hyper hyperactive way. But but today's today's model is definitely a new one in the sense that a lot of the rate uh, actions that that happen so quickly after being so low for so long are indeed creating a, a paradigm shift for for everybody. Um, and so, from our standpoint, when we look at that, we we try to understand you know not only the short term risks that our companies need to manage, uh, we also want to capitalize our business uh, for the long term. Um, there will be a time uh, where volatility will subside. There will be a time. Uh, where recessions uh, will no longer be on the horizon, will be in the rearview mirror. And so, when we establish our our underwriting or or even manage our companies, you know, we're looking out three to five years. So, so the best way to manage, you got to you know, risk manage. You know, we 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 capped our rates in twenty one. All of our companies capped their rates because we knew the rates were really low. We we saw inflation coming. We we tried to buy companies that we knew could pass along inflation, and we didn't think about annual price increases. We thought about uh, you know, literally quarterly or even monthly price increases. So for us, it's about what we do best, uh, which is manage through volatility and look to the long term. That's very interesting. What about the impact of high inflation? How does that um, affect the operation of your portfolio at the moment with all your companies? Well, I think that, you know, when we saw the stimulus money coming in, uh, you know, back in 20 and 21, you know, I think we knew the uh, the ultimate equation if you're an economist is that you can't uh, see anything other than some form of inflation. We didn't know how high and for how long, uh, but since we hold companies for five to 10 years, we knew it was coming in some form over our in investment horizon. Um, so so relative to when we buy a company, you know, one of the first things we look at is what is the capability of that company uh, to pass along uh, their input costs, their labor costs, um, to uh to the to the consumers or the buyers of their of their products and so from our standpoint if you're a leader in an industry uh and you are very good at managing that uh real time uh it's an opportunity actually for private equity because we can fix our capital structures uh we can manage our costs uh and then ultimately the nominal rate of profit expansion is is a benefit to us over over the long term now the big question i think coming into a recession is what are the volume the volumetric impacts of of that inflation because at some point that that will arise in, in a recession of some kind and so we're, we're right now we're managing you know what is that that impact what, what will be the the depth of that recession how will we manage to take share in in the context of that dislocation um so that's sort of the next you know the next paradigm is this earnings and volume recession that i think we're seeing already uh in the environment how, how are you positioning for that 
Well, I do think it comes back to uh, the ability to buy leaders in industries where you you believe there are going to be winners and losers. And so, you know, when volume is going up and rates are low, everybody looks like a hero, and and people can expand their profits uh, in and margins were at an all time high. But when it comes to you know recessions and inflation and the ability to to, to have consumers really continue to demand your products and services, I think it really comes back to positioning yourself to take share. Um, and so, you know, the way we've taken share is is having a, a better a better leadership position in the companies that we buy, but then ultimately consolidating those industries. Uh, we've done a lot on add, add on acquisitions in the last couple of years, uh, consolidating those industries so that we can actually deliver more value to our customers in those companies. And so, for us, it's all about you know leadership consolidation uh, and uh, and taking share. That's very interesting. Can you give some examples of those winners and losers, maybe by sectors of the economy or profiles of companies, as much as you can share? Well, I mean, a great, a great example, which has lived through one of the most volatile uh, uh, cycles that we've ever seen is, is USLBM, which is the one of the leading building uh, products mm-hmm. distributors in, in the marketplace. And, and as a leader, when we saw the spike uh, in, in lumber cost, you know, we were very well positioned uh, mm-hmm. to know what we were going to need to do to to pass along that cost uh, through price increases to manage our profit uh, profit mm-hmm. pools. At the same time, we actually bought a lot of companies across the U.S. to further reinforce our regional market share that so that we could actually be able to to be the leader that gained share in the context of what we're seeing now, which mm-hmm. is price declines and, and obviously some volume softening. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's just just one example. But, you know, certainly lumber prices, if you're following lumber, uh, has been one of the more volatile uh, industries that we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and your and on your ability to deploy capital, you are on the leverage buyout business. Um, how much do high interest rates at the moment, you know, five percentage points higher than where we were, you know, affect your ability to use leverage to do private equity the traditional way? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, you know, it, let's look back on the four. I've, I've been in this business for thirty five years, and. Uh, and actually, over the course of our 40 years as a firm, I'd say maybe two or maybe 25 to 30 years of those 40 years have been rates higher than than these rates. And we, we ended up doing just just fine. So so I don't think that rates themselves at a certain level uh, diminish the opportunity set for, for private equity. Uh, you need to embed those rates in your, your long term outlook as it relates to valuation, because when rates are higher, values obviously for equity. Uh, equity should be lower. Um, and so you have to be mindful of, of what is the impact of, of rates on exit multiples. Um, so right now, I think that while rates are higher and leverage levels are lower, uh, the things that people forget is that prices have come down a lot too, and they probably will come down further. Um, and so I'd much rather buy a company at a lower price with higher rates uh, than at a higher price with low rates, uh, particularly when I think there's risk of re-rating to the downside. Mm-hmm. Which I think we saw a lot of between you know eighteen to twenty to where values are today. Hmm. What about the amount of debt available though versus equity as the market adjusts at the moment as to these new rates? We've seen banks retrenching, um, private equity firms now that are also have become direct lenders for leveraged buyouts also being much more cautious. It's also this concern about a potential economic recession, or we'll see. But a general you know awareness that there there is more. Um, risk now with the credit quality of some companies. So the quantum of debt is smaller. Does that affect your investment returns? And does it affect what you underwrite for return expectations? Well, certainly I think, again, it affects value. So so I think that one of the things we've been seeing uh, in the marketplace is that, you know, right away values adjust to, to where cost of capital is. Now, some people will make a forward bet on being able to you know, get more leverage later, or maybe rates will be lower later, uh, but I do think that in the first instance, valuation you know does does adjust. Now, you know we saw this in in the GFC, we saw this in two thousand one. I you know I do think it takes some time. So the seasoning of values, particularly in the public market, uh, uh, do take time to to really have private buyers uh, and private sellers or public sellers to to really adjust expectations. So I still think we're you know, only halfway through the ball game to get to that seasoning, but but I think valuations just have to have to come down. But but the other piece, which I think is is part of what you're alluding to, um, is is the commitment and scale from from the big banks. Uh, and the reason that's important 
is because not only do you need to commit to that size uh, of uh, debt structure, but you need to do it for a long time, particularly in public to privates. And that's probably where the biggest value is today is public to privates. Uh, the challenge of of non-commitments by big banks is that you know they won't hold that for 12 months um mm. you know because they're uncertain about the the range of outcomes from here and so without that type of you know large committed capital um you're not seeing the syndication market and the long-term duration of commitments really being made in in the marketplace today um so you mm. have to rely, you have to rely on direct lenders and that that cost of credit is is very high, um, probably abnormally high. It's a it's a great time to be a credit investor, I think, uh, and uh, and that does require though for the equity to to adjust price accordingly. Can you give some range to that adjustment in the equity, roughly? What are we talking about? Going from a twenty percent IRR to fifty percent IRR, just and I know it varies by deal opportunity and sector, but just a flavor of how this affects equity returns. Well, interesting. You know, it's, it's, you know, when when we were all doing uh, leverage buyouts through through most of the period after the GFC, the cost of capital through your whole capital structure was five. You know, call it five. You know, five to six percent. Um, and then the risk premium for equity was underwritten to twenty uh, to twenty five percent. Um, you know, what's what's interesting about this moment in time is that, uh, you know, the the leverage structure probably through the through the junior, if you can get junior, is probably more like. Eight to ten, um, you know, for for scale, um, and so you know, my guess is you have to underwrite to to a higher risk premium, but frankly, that risk premium was always a bit too wide, not because of the equity risk premium, but really the debt wasn't adequately, I think, giving a risk return to the debt. So to me, I think the natural thing that happened is is the debt moved up to more normalized level, but the equity return expectations will still remain the same, and that's probably more consistent with the period prior to the GFC. That's very interesting. Just to go back to the to the banks pre, um, uh, briefly, and the, and the point you made about their woes. Um, what are you hearing based on your banking relationship relationship about the impact that the downfall of Silicon Valley Bank and um, one more you know regional lender um, here in the U.S. Signature Bank has had on how banks um, you know think about how they you know, deploy their own assets to be able to have, you know, a balance sheet to lend. Uh, we've seen, you know, the banking turmoil spread in Europe and um, in other places. Um, what, and a lot of people are trying to figure out whether Silicon Valley Bank represents a major, um, you know, risk event for banks that will then affect how they deploy capital across the economy, including in your line of business. What do you see the impact the fallout be? I mean, we're still in the early days of that, but what do you sense the fallout will be out of that? Well, yeah, there's a lot of questions there, Greg. I'll I'll try to give you a sort of a top-down view and then maybe get into the, the details. And I do think the broader issue with lenders um, and those that are trying to manage risk and return expectations, particularly around assets and liabilities, is that they've seen this huge shift in rate um, in, in a way that really is unprecedented uh, with with the Fed. So so the implications of that are, you know, if your business model was not resilient to that type of rate change at that speed, um, did that present something that you didn't expect in your business model? I think that was the case with Silicon Valley Bank. Now, Silicon Valley Bank, we have very limited uh, exposure to them. It wasn't a big deal for us, but, but certainly I think that, you know, the questions that are getting raised then about uh, Silicon Valley Bank are, you know, where is uh, sort of the liability and asset matching and where is the duration risks and where is the, you know, the rate return expectations that both their depositors and then ultimately the assets uh, return potential, where does that all sit and what liquidity concerns are out there? Um, and that's the broader point, I think. And that's not just true, as you say, about banks. That's true of private equity. Um, you know, where is refinancing risk going to arise over the course of the next two to three years? With rates being this high, how is that going to affect uh, exits relative to where the multiples are? So I think everybody is going through this period of disorientation based on, you know, how rates have impacted both liquidity, uh, return expectation, mm -hmm. and ultimately, ultimately exits. You know, from our standpoint, the banks are actually really well positioned. Um, you know, I've I've met with many of the banks over the course of the last couple months, and they're very excited about the fact that they're in this great position. Um, and so they should be much more than the GFC capable of really provi providing uh, a real opportunity to, to lend. 
um, frankly, and make some really good money doing so. Uh, but I think what's getting in the way is this fear of of sort of what is that outcome five, you know, five, six months out, you know, relative to where the rate goes for the Fed, you know, relative to where spreads go. And so for them to commit capital, you know, that ultimately results in a closing of a deal, you know, nine months from now or you know, 12 months from now for regulatory, it's just something that they're not prepared yet to do. And that's why the direct lenders are still you know, the capital choice provider for buyouts today uh, and will be, I think, until this gets more settled. Got it. Um, and uh, would you invest in a U.S. regional bank today? Uh, you know, we don't really uh, have a practice of doing uh, mm. sort of a lot of those investment activities. We've done some of that in emerging markets, um, you know, where we think the ROE uh, can be really interesting, uh, but we're we're less inclined to do dislocation balance sheet bets. We're very much focused on, you know, long term operating earning expansion, um, you know, relative to that. Um, but look, we've done it in international markets, and you know where there's a where there's an opportunity, we'll at least uh, you know try to evaluate whether it fits our our criteria. Got it. Um, going back to credit, um, because Bain is a big investor in credit. Where do you see now? In this new environment, the big opportunities in the credit space as an investor. Well, again, there is this there is this void out there, and you know, I think as you talked about, it's not just the big, you know, the big banks with sort of the big buyouts. It's really just even the mid market. Mm -hmm. um, and so, frankly, back since the the late '90s, you know, we've had a mid market lending practice. Uh, we were the, one of the first that actually got into uh, credit lending uh, because we saw opportunities for to premium returns. In, in both investing in the debt, but also in participating in, in the equity upside with with partners that we financed. So that's always been a big business for us. And, uh, you know, that business has expanded rapidly uh, over the course of this dislocation because the void uh, that's out there and in, in not only just big banks, but even medium sized banks. So I think it's a really great opportunity for all the players who have scale platforms in, in credit like we do um, uh, to really for the first time earn, earn a really good both absolute return, but also uh, risk premium to to where uh, credit really should be an opportunity for multi-strap players. And, and I think that even after the banks come back, you know, I think the the plumbing around that hold to maturity, that, you know, ability not just to be a commit and syndicator, but actually uh, be a fundamental long-term credit investor is a really healthy thing, uh, which I think will lead to further penetration of the of the alternative, alternative credit players in, in this marketplace. Good. Uh, how do you sense your appetite um, from your limited partners, from your investors um, for alternative assets broadly? And maybe then you can break it down by a sector like private equity or credit or real estate, especially given that people now are thinking much more about liquidity risk. Yeah, you know, I do think at least from our our LPs and and maybe there are some different forms of LPs that have different different types of profiles it's really not as much liquidity um that's the issue for our LPs um the bigger issue is just where they wanted to position their percentage mix in terms of uh you know private assets or private equity or alternatives as a percentage of their overall portfolios you know as i think back to 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 the GFC and i've been on the board of some endowments uh, in the past you know, I do think um, they were pretty well positioned from a liquidity. They they all had learned from the, you know, the scars of the 08 uh, crisis. Um, and so from our standpoint, it's really more about they want to get into into balance. They want to rotate back into uh, the percentages that they wanted to have in private credit and in private equity and in public equity. Um, and because of the, the, the dislocation in values, particularly in the public markets, you know they're they're way over percentage wise on the private side. So so yes, that's a form of liquidity because the only way to get there is they need to figure out how to monetize assets. But certainly, you know, you're seeing the secondary market being more robust uh, than we've ever seen before in this cycle. Uh, you're seeing more liquidity options, um, and, and over time, I think that will normalize. Uh, particularly because one of the big issues is that people were just investing too fast. Uh, you know, basically raising funds and and the models for those. Uh, pensions and endowments didn't expect them to invest in in a couple of years. Got it. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, ESG, um, which you know um, 
is becoming more and more prominent on the regulatory front in terms of um, regulators both in EU, Europe and US um, ramping up on their uh, requirements, including on disclosure, but also attracting you know quite a bit of a backlash politically, particularly here in the United States, in some Republican-run states. Um, they often use public pension funds um you know that are run you know um by the states to to exercise their muscle to go after asset managers they believe are in their view um have some ESG policies that you know go too far have you experienced that at all with any of your public pension fund investors uh clients uh how have you approached ESG in the last year Well, look, I think for, first of all, I mean, ESG is kind of one of those words that you know, to, you know, becomes a little bit of a, a a lightning rod around things that I think are, from our standpoint, um, you know, fundamental to how we've always done business. Um, you know, even the idea of good corporate governance. You know, you're asking me what I did in the last year, but frankly, for the last forty years, I think one of the virtues of our private equity industry and certainly our firm is that we've been focused on incredibly good corporate. Governance. Um, that's one of the benefits of, of of being in this model is is we're much better, particularly in international markets, emerging markets, um, and and managing those risks for the long term is is important. But you know, look at the end of the day, we're in the business of generating returns. But part of that, in our view, is to generate uh, value in companies that that think long term. And as any company who thinks long term, they're going to be very focused on their employee and labor policies. They're going to be very focused on the ability to attract great talent, diverse talent being a big opportunity that doesn't really get tapped in the way it should. They're going to be very focused on you know the elements of creating sustainability and long-term resilience. And so all of these elements of ESG, as it's called, you know, frankly, get politicized in a way that really you know forgets the fundamentals of these are all good practices for long-term business building. Mm. Mm-hmm. And 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 by the way, that doesn't mean we're generating a lower return. We're generating as good a return as ever, and we can't deliver what we need to to our LPs unless we deliver that return. But I think it's integral to the long term business building that at least our firm, you know, does. Um, now, what's interesting about private equity, which people don't understand or talk about as much, is that rather than a passive asset allocator who basically is trying to put a filter on you know, ESG policies or ESG, um, you know, metrics, you know, the, the thing we can do is we can go into a company, whether it's a, uh, you know, somebody has done a lot with ESG or not, um, and we can create a blueprint that's highly integrated to our broader strategic and operating blueprint, and we can take a five to 10 year view. Um, and because we're inside the company, because we control the company, we can deliver that value in the right way uh, because of our value addition and control. Uh, you can't do that in the public market. You can't do that in the debt market. And so all of these, I think, asset allocators that are in the passive markets, it's a much harder thing for them to do. Got it. We have seen an effort to uh, try to get you know, capital markets uh, to reward companies for advancing ESG, um, whether it's green bonds, sustainability linked loans, and we have seen that with private equity portfolio companies. Have you been part of that effort? How do you approach it? How do you see it? Well, certainly we think the premium for being um, sort of on the right side of history for sustainability, you know, is is certainly a thesis inside a lot of our companies, um, you know, and and when we get it right, not only does it allow you to generate a lot of interest from investors when you exit, but frankly, it allows you to gain market share um, from customers who are looking to shift, you know, perhaps for something that has got a higher carbon footprint to something that has a lower carbon footprint. So the sort of the operating opportunities, the product and value proposition for, for certain companies can actually generate better operating performance uh, because of gaining market share, but also, um, you know, better better appetite from an exit standpoint. We have a business called Fedragoni, which we uh you know, just sold uh, in partnership with with our our new fund. We partner with another sponsor, but its thesis is around you know uh, the types of of products that are more sustainable in terms of paper and disposable and recyclable products inside labeling uh, and packaging. And that element of its business plan has allowed it to to generate you know greater success than its 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 substitute products. And then ultimately a really interesting exit for uh, for our firm. So. 
part of that is is really just again building great businesses who are on the right side of history and um you know less than just you know sort of some of these more tactical tools around you know you know the bonds and the and the and the, the ESG bonds and all that mm -hmm. it's more of the fundamentals of the businesses we're buying got it one more question for me and then we'll uh move to audience questions for about 15 minutes a reminder you can use the box on your screen to ask john a question um John, we've seen uh, a few alternative asset managers go public in the last few years. Um, Bain has, you know, resisted, um, and I can ask you whether, you know, that will, you know, remain the stance. But I can also ask you, because you are one of the top alternative asset managers, how does that affect your business development, rewarding talent, being able to do acquisitions, not having um, stock as, you know, um, as a, a public public stock as currency even kind of like to pay current current interest now you know the performance fees um, some private equity firms do what have you missed out on and what have you gained by by remaining private yourself um well i've missed out on a lot of public scrutiny from public shareholders given the volatility in those stocks and so i'm quite um, I'm quite happy uh, to uh, to be in that position but but actually honestly um i've been asked this question uh, since 2008 when this whole journey of what does it mean to be public, you know, was was advanced. Um, and and, on, and really, you know, people said at the time, you know, how can you grow? How can you develop new business strategies? How do you, you know, think about the talent impact? And that journey since 08, actually, everything I've seen, you know, was contrary to what you know, I was being told would be the case were we to not go public. We've developed eight new businesses over the course of that period. Uh, you know, we've uh, more than quadrupled our our AUM. Frankly, the AUM that we've been able to focus on is not just you know high velocity, low fee, um, you know commodity oriented alternatives. It's really focused on the best part of alternatives, which is you know high alpha uh, equity and and credit uh, and real estate uh, products. And so, from our standpoint, it's really created a filter for where do we think the most interesting spaces are in alternative assets, and how do we attract talent. Because we're we're private, because we haven't given away half of our economics to mm. public shareholders, that's gone forever. You know, we have a balance sheet, by the way. Um, we actually did uh, acquire a business uh, to get into real estate. You know, we do have the opportunity to provide currency to our employees because they're invested across our, our entire business platform and and participate in the balance sheet earnings and performance uh, as a partner in in our multiple businesses. So. You know, everybody asks me that question, and, and I say, well, I'm not saying we would never go public, but I would say unless I can find an opportunity that suggests that it's an advantage for us, um, we wouldn't go public. And today, or at least since the GFC, we found it to be an advantage for us, uh, mm -hmm. and, and we think for our partnership, people really rally behind that. Got it. Um, other than um... – the balance sheet, what has your approach been to permanent capital? I'm trying to remember, do you have a business development company, for example? I know you invest in insurance, but like, do you own a reinsurer that has become like a very popular model now? What has been kind of like your approach basically to having capital outside the fund model? We do have a BDC. We have a public BDC. Mm -hmm. We also have a, we also have a private BDC. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that in the case of our real estate business, that's still in fund form. But we're constantly evaluating sort of the forms of permanent capital that that could be interesting. You know, frankly, our permanent capital that's the most permanent is our own capital. You'd be surprised. I won't I won't reference it here. How much of our of our capital is our own partnership capital, um, which, which how is, much is it? <laughs> uh, it's it's more significant by a multiple than you'd see in any other alternative assets asset manager, particularly particularly of our scale. But it's really aligning with our investors, frankly. Um and so I think I do think the innovation in in how capital gets formed for our industry continues to evolve in a way that I think is healthy. Um, I think more permanent capital, less frictional cost across uh, transactional uh, deals uh, for ownership for longer term uh, holds. I, all these things that you've seen arise, I think, are good for our industry. And so you know I do think as you think about that next chapter of private equity, you know, private equity is still only about four percent of the equity markets overall. Uh, you know, the LBO private equity and the AUM is only like three trillion, you know, and that's about four percent of, of the overall equity market. So we got a long way to go. Uh, but on that journey, um, I do think you'll see a lot more innovation on how 
capital gets formed and how capital gets deployed and the duration of that capital. That's great. Let's switch to audience questions. And um, the first question I think is brilliant. We have a very smart audience. So why haven't we seen, John, um, a further drop um, in the marks, the valuations of private equity funds across the board? And will this resilience continue? It's a great question. And, you know, it's hard for me to, um, you know, observe the policies and the approaches that the industry takes. I, I can tell you that in 2020, uh, 2022, um, our earnings growth for our companies that we've owned have, have been 15%. Um, and, you know, that's a pretty healthy growth uh, for a comp set of companies, a large set of companies across, you know, geographies and, and verticals. Um, and so the notion of, of you know, taking down something that has gone up uh, earnings wise, 15 percent doesn't seem all that logical. I think that the other piece of our approach is that when we underwrote deals, you know, frankly, since 18, um, you know, we always underwrote to a view of normalized multiples. So unlike, um, you know, unlike, you know, perhaps the public market, which is kind of increasingly paid a higher and higher price. Uh, uh, for earnings, you know, we did pay some higher prices, but when we underwrote the deal, we underwrote it to a five-year plan where exit multiples would uh, normalize. So basically, if you assume that we're underwriting to a twenty to twenty-five percent return, we're having fifteen percent earnings, and even with normalized multiples, we think we can still generate twenty to twenty-five percent returns. You know, it makes no sense to uh, reduce multiples. And frankly, if anything, we've seen our most recent funds. You know, the momentum being ones where we would increase the value. That's not true of public companies. Public companies got to a very high level um, and the multiple reset overnight. Frankly, I think it's probably oversold in many of the sectors. Um, and so it, it probably, even though it's trading value is is a certain value, it's probably undervalued in, in certain sectors. And so that that's very different um, you know, in terms of evaluation approach and in terms of an operating uh, context for, for our companies. Now, other private equity firms, if you bought a lot of growth in tech in 21 and 22, I'd be wondering pretty, I'd be wondering myself uh, whether uh, those things should be taken down because there's been a 50% or 40% uh, reduction in value and, yeah. and if people underwrite yeah. that. I, I suspect not. That's very interesting because you've seen in some pockets, investors questioning the discrepancy in the valuation between public markets and private markets, the REITs, for example, and the non-traded REITs was you know, once you drop, do you expect other areas now where investors will scrutinize a little bit that differential more? I can see how you can you justify it in your own portfolio, but like, um, do do you see that you know? I, I think that becoming the, a theme. I think one. I think one of the most important questions that's out there, which is you know, which maybe speaks to this uncertainty, which is which is a fair uncertainty, is that we've never seen, at least not since you know I started in this business, we've never seen. The landscape of what exit multiples might be, um, you know, three to four or five years from now, uh, we've never seen it be as uncertain in terms of that that wide range. You know, if you have a view that rates are going back uh, to where they were in the you know in midway through the GFC expansion, and and you know inflation is going to be two percent, you know maybe you get back to multiples not at the 20, 21, 22 levels, but maybe you get back to the 15, 16 levels. But you could take a different view, which is kind of where I started. You know, with rates, you know, at five percent high yield, maybe at ten percent, you know, uh, you know, I think growth being something that has a higher discount, you could see valuations be going way back uh, to the to the nineties levels, to the to the mid two thousand levels, and so that that width of exit value, I think, is is hard to judge right now, and so it puts a lot of pressure on you know, this whole question of where will rates go, uh, how much operating earnings growth uh, do you really think you can get in this environment. Uh, and then you have to believe that across a pretty wide range of multiples, you can generate a, a, a good return. So that's a big uncertainty, Greg. And I think that will play out as as we see where rates stabilize and inflation goes over the next couple of years. So how how do you make assumptions? Do you when you deploy capital, do you um, make the most conservative exit assumption instead of multiples, somewhere in the middle? Like what view do you find yourself normally taking? Yeah, it's a, it's a philosophical question that you know, it that, must be that, specific. I understand it must be company specific. No, no, but no. Yeah. I, I, it's a great question. I I do think that we try to find companies that can live across you know 
a, a, a great range of returns. So we look at asymmetric upside as, as the way we look at our deals. So if we can generate a return that normalizes multiples back to, you know, periods of time 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and maybe the returns, if it goes back to 20 years ago, won't be as good uh, as we would like. But if it sort of is in within that range, if we still can generate, you know, 20 to 25, I think that, you know, we're still looking at a pretty wide range. Now, if it went back, by the way, to, you know, to 21 levels, you know, that's only upside from here. But we certainly are going back, you know, 10 years as we're looking at exit multiples. Got it. Another great question. Have you been postponing any exits at the moment in the current market? You know, one of the, one of the things I learned a long time ago is that, um, you know, thinking you have an exit point in your uh, horizon as a private equity investor is a kind of a misplaced um, a misplaced target, you know, because the, one of the beauties of our industry is that we can, we can actually find times when, you know, when we want to exit and then ultimately not exit in more adverse environments. But if you don't plan for the idea that you're going to have those adverse environments, then you're probably not a, a great private equity investor. So, so whenever we look at a company, you know, we love to believe there's an opportunity to invest uh, and then ultimately exit earlier than five years, but we have to believe that we, can live within a window of, you know, three to 10 years in our investment horizon. So, you know, the ability to have a resilient return that, you know, allows you to sue, to, to generate that return independent of exit optionality, I think is, is one of the first principles of our, of our business. So back in 18, 19, 20, I mean, we were thinking there's going to be dislocation in credit markets and value. And we didn't think about COVID, but, but, you know, you know, COVID happened. And then we thought, you know, Ultimately, uh, that rebound that we saw was kind of amazing, but now we're seeing, you know, the rates on the other side with a recession. So from our standpoint, you know, this will be longer duration perhaps than we wanted, but we were expecting mm. it wasn't going to be a lot of quick flips and, you know, short duration exits, and, and nor do we ever think that that's part of the way we we underwrite. Um, and so as long as you have companies that are generating 15% returns uh, over the uh, operating uh, growth over the course of a of a cycle, um, you'll just be be fine, and we'll wait for the markets to return. Got it. Um, another question from the audience: uh, What metrics do you use to assess the improvement of sustainability in your portfolio companies? Well, we try to meet. I mean, the good the good news or bad news, I guess, with with a portfolio of 175 companies, some have a higher and, and lower, uh, you know, uh, footprint uh, around where the, where we meet them when we buy them, and so you know, we don't. Uh, we don't look at where they stand at the time we get there, but we try to find a way to to uh, to create science based targets, to create a baseline, and then ultimately uh, improve from there. You know, based on you know what we can accomplish over the course of of um, of the horizon that we own it. So so you know, it's basically taking that baseline and then having a target. I would say our industry um, and uh, we too are early days. Uh, there's so many different metrics. There's so many different ways of thinking about the right targets for the right industries. But you know. The, the idea of what we can do again as a private equity industry is pretty, pretty interesting because we do track metrics. We we can create accountability for our management teams. We can look at the long term, and so, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put that plumbing in. But you know, anybody that tells you that it's working and you know everything has, um, you know, has a has a goal that that is working the way you want it to longer term, I think that's it's still early days. Got it. Um, another question. We have a very sophisticated audience today. So can you elaborate a little bit on um, how your normalized uh, assumptions on multiples work? Um, the the member of the audience asks, uh, I assume you don't mark the acquisition to more than one times the capital to less than one cap less than one times the, the capital invested at day one in the fund. How do, how, how do you go about it? Well, you know, we try to look at, um, you know, what was our underwriting relative to the risk of that of that of that transaction. So, relative to an equity return of twenty to twenty five percent, with an exit multiple again that we would believe to be normalized. Um, you know, we try to take each quarter a judgment on, you know, relative to our operating progress and relative to that exit multiple has something changed. And so, as long as we believe we're on a a trajectory to that five-year, you know, model that that would indicate uh, the return still is twenty to twenty-five percent. We'll, you know, we'll we'll be marking it up over time to that twenty-five percent markup. 
So that's the way we do it. Um, so I guess theoretically, if we sold the business the next day, um, if we bought it above the normalized multiple, I guess you could say that it is, um, you know, at that point in time, lower value. But the reality is, given we're looking at a five-year horizon, as long as we're on that same plan and we've assumed a lower multiple and we're not selling that day, we would never sell that day, um, you actually find yourself uh, marking it up over time. You know, what, one of the things that is most important is um, price per unit of growth. I mean, that sort of was the first part of your question. Um, and we are religious about looking at what's the price per unit of unlevered growth as a metric for what is the normalized multiple. Um, and so what we saw throughout the GFC expansion and ultimately really, really extreme in 20 and 21 is the price per unit of growth went up, you know, very, very high, very, very rapidly. Um, and so, frankly, we lost a lot of market share in 21 and 22 because we weren't prepared to pay for that expansion in price per unit of growth. So we, we don't have that, quote unquote, immediate markdown exposure, at least, I mean, we have it in some places, but we don't have it to the degree others who really kind of put 50% in tech and put 50% of their funds in 21 and 22. Got it. Another question from the audience is, um, are dividend recaps gone in this environment and are your limited partners upset about it? Um, are limited partners upset about it? Um, I don't know that limited partners have a point of view on on <laughs> dividend recaps. I, I think they're trying to get great returns. You know, I think they're trying to manage you to your point. You know, it's kind of the, the the outbound commitments, the unfunded commitments, and then how quickly they go out. I, you know, to to me, I think um, you know recaps obviously are really valuable. I, I do believe they're not available right now, um, except for in businesses that. Uh, you're generating a lot of cash. We actually, believe it or not, did an old-fashioned cash dividend um, from uh, this company that I mentioned earlier, USLBM. So, so you're still able to do dividends if you're generating uh, cash in companies. But yeah, it, it's gone for now. But my sense would be that if, particularly if people are under-levering businesses and rates come down in the next two to three years, you know, my guess is they return. Um, and so they're always a little bit of a luxury, I guess, if you will, to our model. They're not something again we don't rely on them as part of our underwriting but you know if we can return capital because we've generated inflection in our operating earnings and the debt markets are there um yeah it's it's always kind of a, a bit of an option ticket um you know in, in good markets that that we'll take advantage of got it and i think we have time for one last question so um we talked about exits um what has the impact been on your approach to exit um, from the nuclear nuclear winter we've seen for initial public offerings, have you how have you approached IPOs traditionally versus an outright sale for an exit route for you know portfolio companies? And what has you know the market being largely shut down still with this volatility, uh, not for all companies but for many, uh, done to your you know exit models. Well, I, th I mean, look, I think that part, part of part of it is is the whole uh, narrative I I suggested around you know not not relying on a view that markets will always be there, and it's hard hard when when they're they're not there obviously this year and, and last year, but but I think that in the time um, in the meantime, I guess you know what we have. And sorry to interrupt you, John. I think I'm seeing remember like Bain had traditionally a preference for M and A for an outright sale for an exit as opposed to IPO. Is that fair or or? I, I, no, I wouldn't say that. We, no? we actually okay. we we've actually done a lot of IPOs. And frankly, mm -hmm. one of the things we're most proud of is our IPO track record. You know, I think private equity sometimes has this reputation somehow of you know once they take a company public, the return profile, you know, is is under underwhelming relative to the to the market overall. But frankly, in our history as a firm, our, our private equity performance after we've gone public relative to public indices has been a huge premium. Um, and so I hope it's a big shout out to all the mutual funds out there that they should be buying private equity uh, IPOs because you know we build these companies for the long term. We don't actually exit at the IPO. And so in some ways, we're partners with the buy side and they should think about it that way. Um, but in the meantime, back to your question, you know, we have had to be more creative. Um, you know, the private markets are still more robust right now than the public markets. And so the the, the appetite, the bid for 
uh, for for other sponsors to basically work with an existing sponsor to um, you know recap a little bit of the equity out uh, to get some liquidity to create a, a mark uh, that is you know a third party mark to maybe transport a, a capital structure that is uh, built for the long term but but frankly uh, you know off market because it's lower cost today we, we've done all of those things um, you know to get some exits in the last uh, uh, year and and so the the exits are not as as high as 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 they once were but frankly our our investment velocity is about equal to our exit velocity, even in 21 and 22. That's great. Well, John, thank you so much for this very interesting, um, very detailed uh, discussion. I think a lot of people found it useful. Uh, thank you so much for joining us um, on this road as newsmaker. Thank you uh, to our audience and uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank you, everyone. Great. Pleasure.